Hello everyone, and welcome to the Infrastructure Engineering Session of ESAC 2019. My name is Maria Dimitri, and I'm an Infra QP of Steve. In a recent report, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has suggested that the international community has until 2030 to begin taking serious action on climate change. One major area of concern is cities, as they uh, are estimated to produce 75% of global carbon dioxide emissions, with the transportation sector being a major contributor. As engineers, we need to be able to design our cities in a way that meets the demands of citizens while also promoting the goal of sustainability for future generations. This is why it is my absolute pleasure today to introduce Dr. Shoshana Sack, Assistant Professor at the Department of Civil and Mineral Engineering near UP. Uh, her research focuses on large-scale sustainable urban infrastructure and public transit, as well as the relationship between our infrastructure and our travel behavior and land use. The work she does in understanding the complexities of the societal and environmental impact of infrastructure is critical in helping policymakers make smart decisions. Dr. Sachs holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering and applied mechanics from McGill, a master's degree in civil and environmental engineering at, from MIT, and a PhD in engineering from the University of Cambridge. She is an alumna of Action Canada and a member of the Transportation Research Board Standing Committee on Transportation and Sustainability. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Shoshana Sachs. Thank you. You need to turn on the microphone. Okay, can you hear me? Excellent, so I have two mics, so I feel very technical. Um, uh, thanks for having me today for what I believe is the final infrastructure talk. So it's an honor to help shut down the program. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I, I think we'll have fun today, and I applaud you all for going against the grain. You are not the sheep in the robotics talk. You are the independent thinkers in the infrastructure talk. So uh, today, in this theme of what this talk is about, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my background, how I got here, what kind of things I did on the route. Um, I'm going to tell you why infrastructure is not only the most interesting question and problem ever, but also the foundation of all of functioning society. It's a low bar. We're going to hit it. Um, and then I'll tell you a little bit about my research and then some opportunities to get involved. So I did my undergraduate at McGill University, and I apparently took absolutely no photos of working. Um, because when I went back to try and first make a talk like this, this is all I could find. Uh, so we had a really good time. Um, this is flag football. We also had broom ball. Did you play broom, broom ball at U of T? You should start it. It's like hockey, but in rubber shoes. Um, and then a lot of concrete toboggan. Oh yeah, that's broom ball, hockey, but in rubber shoes. Um, and I went to McGill for civil engineering, um, in large part because I wanted to work on big, massive things I could touch. I was interested in huge structures that didn't move and that would last a really long time. I mean, civil engineers, we build the pyramids, we build the Coliseum, basically all the wonder of the world, that was us. And I wanted to be one of those people. And at first, specifically, I wanted to blow up things that needed to be blown up, like friendly blowing up, like demolition. Um, and so I thought, civil engineering, I'll learn how buildings work, and then I will blow them up for a career. Um, I was wrong about that, which is a consistent theme in my career trajectory, is that if you have asked me at any point what I thought I would be doing in five years, I would have been wrong every single time. Um, I'm about three years into my current position, so check back in in 2021. I may break that streak here. So after McGill, I went to MIT and I did a master's in geotechnical engineering, which is civil engineering from the ground down. So how do we do things in the ground? And the reason I chose that over structural engineering or water resources or some of the other options that are available is that it was the one with the most uncertainty. The ground changes all the time. Even if you take a sample of it, it's not necessarily going to be predictive of ground even a meter away. And we've gotten pretty good at that, but I thought, okay, this is really fun. We're not going to know really what the answers to this all the time. We're going to operate all the time in an area of uncertainty. I want to be a geotechnical engineer. So I went to MIT where I did take a picture of myself in my office. Um, and, uh, you know, famously on the steps in front of the building. And I spent a couple really wonderful years there, and I originally thought I was there to do a PhD. Um, and at orientation, it said MASC slash PhD. 
And I was convinced for the next five years that's what I was going to be doing, and I was wrong about that as well. And after two years with my master's, I thought, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. I have been in school now for seven years. It's time to go engineer something, or what have I been talking about all this time? So I went and I got a job. And I worked with an engineering consulting firm as a geotechnical engineer, building things that are underground. And so this is at the Second Avenue subway in New York, uh, which was built almost entirely through rock, and which they finally completed after about 102 years, not always of building, but of starting and stopping. And so the people on Second Avenue had been promised a subway for many generations, and it finally opened a couple years ago. Um, and this is on site in Montreal. Um, I was young, I was female, I was very popular in construction sites, and so they let me play with the torches. And um, I didn't yet have a site jack jacket, so I was wearing my grandmother's 1980 giant silver poof. Um, it was a good look, uh, but they let me practice welding, um, and we took pictures. I'm sure it violated no health and safety rules. Um, and I did that for three years, and then it was great. I loved lots of things about design, and I got to work on a lot of really interesting structures. So has anyone ever flown on Billy Bishop? Um, has everyone ever flown on Porter? So this one is the Porter Tunnel. I was involved in that project. Um, spent a lot of time on site in the airport looking at rock cores, which could sound really boring, but it's actually really fun, um, especially when the drillers' um, parents make the world's best pickles. Um, this is Vaughn Corporate Center construction site. Um, this is York University. Um, this is a park downtown on the waterfront, which is actually a parking lot, which is the part I worked on, but the park is a lot prettier. And so I worked on projects for three years, many of which are now open, some of which are still opening. And design was great. I loved getting to work on things that were real. Um, my legacy is assured all of these things will outlive me, but uh, when we're working in the design space, so if this is the realm of knowledge of the things I know, to be safe, we always needed to be here. And after a couple years, um, to put it lightly, I was bored out of my mind. Um, I wanted to work not on questions that I knew the answer to, but on questions I didn't know the answer to, and ideally on questions that nobody knew the answer to. And so that precipitated a return to research. I was particularly interested in the question of what are the sustainability credentials of the large infrastructure we build? I'd spent about 10 years at that point thinking and planning to work on large infrastructure, and when I got into the practice of it, we were not asking the questions I thought were the most important. We were wasting money and materials because we weren't asking them, and we weren't necessarily building the right infrastructure. So I went to Cambridge to do my PhD, and before you ask, yes, I did meet the queen. Um, and. Uh, being Canadian, I got to play on the hockey team, because basically if you can skate, you're an excellent hockey player in, in the UK. Uh, and it was a really uh, wonderful experience. Um, has anyone heard of Pancake Day? Yes. Okay, so Pancake Day, which has something to do with Easter, which I don't entirely understand, so ask your friends who put their hands up. But in my college, it just meant that we raced with pancakes. So it was a relay race with a frying pan and a pancake, and at various points, we had to flip the pancake and then keep running. Uh, we did not win. The undergrads kicked butt, um, but we beat the faculty. Uh, and meanwhile, I was there, I also did some research. So I was interested in the sustainability credential of, of what we build, and so I started looking at, if you include all of the system scale impacts of building a metro system, what are the net environmental impacts of that? If metros are this great opportunity we have to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by changing people's travel behavior, having transport-oriented development, are we achieving that? And if we're not achieving that, could we tweak some things so that we could be achieving that? Because why waste an uh, amazing opportunity, especially if it's a multi-billion dollar amazing opportunity? So I looked at the materials that go into construction, I looked at long-term travel behavior changes, I looked at land use changes, and I got a payback period that said we were paying back in about 12 years if I made all optimistic assumptions all the time for the areas where we didn't have data or had fuzzy data. And if we say 12-year payback, you could say that's way too long, right? In financial, in any of the startup rooms, they're going to say we want three-year return, we want six-month return, everything's going faster all the time. I don't live in that world. This infrastructure is going to be around for 100 years. Maybe 12 years is fine. Maybe it's too slow, maybe it's fine. But if you start making more medium scale assumptions, the curve bends up in a way that's a little bit concerning, and now you're looking at you know, 27 years. 
And if you make bottom end assumptions, it's never paying back. And so what this told me is that we're both not being efficient enough in our use of materials and construction, but we're also not taking advantage of the opportunities we're building for ourselves. So for instance, one of the things that we often do in, tra in transit-related infrastructure in North America is people get upset when we're reallocating space away from cars. And we say, no, don't be upset at us, we'll give you lots of free parking. And so we undermine the change that we could have precipitated. And I found that we weren't, through our policy space, through our land use rules, we were not taking advantage of this billion dollar piece of infrastructure to get the kind of returns we wanted. And so I said that in a paper, we need to be more efficient about how we build, we need to also have stronger policies, you need the carrot and the stick. Uh, and it got into the press, and I started getting press coverage and attention for it, including in um, Wired magazine. And this precipitated a bunch of really interesting responses. Because, of course, some people heard a very different story than the one I thought that I was telling. And I heard recently from a friend who works in transit that before he met me, he was at a meeting of a bunch of transit authorities, and they were like, just tearing my work to shreds. It's total crap. This is definitely not true. It couldn't be possible. And thinking that I was saying we should not be building subways, which is absolutely not what I was saying. We should be building subways. But they're an opportunity. They're an opportunity that comes rarely. And we should be doing everything we can to take advantage of them. And just so you don't think I'm saying we should not build subways, this is the payback period of roads, which is never. It just continues polluting ad infinitum. So building a transportation system built on roads, definitely not going to achieve our sustainability goals. Building one other ways, there's an opportunity, but just because the opportunity exists doesn't mean we'll seize it. Um, and I've done many more things since then. I became a postdoc after that, and then I became a faculty member, and then I do research full time. But while I probably will never be as rich as some of the other speakers this week, um, and the scale of the problems that I work on are different, the work itself has been deeply rewarding, and I've also gotten to do amazing things. So precipitated by the shutdown, I decided to apply to Nexus last week so that I don't have to worry about getting stuck at the airports next time the American government closes. And so one of the things I had to list was every single country I'd been to in the last five years. And it turns out I've been to seven, 27 countries. Um, and almost all of that was work-related. And I know that's kind of a, it's an oxymoron, I'm a sustainability person, I'm fly all the time. I live with the inconsistency. But, so this is in Australia for work, where I went surfing in Bondi Beach at six in the morning. Um, this was at Cambridge. This is in San Francisco. Uh, has anyone seen the solar, um, the wind turbine at the, um, at the waterfront? So that's me sitting in the nacelle of the wind turbine. Um, that one's in Ghana, and that's off a boat in the lower Arctic at the tip of Newfoundland in a place called Nunatsiavut. Um, and this is giant Jenga, because if you're good at, at infrastructure, you'll be good at center of gravity, and you will win at giant Jenga. Okay, so that's me. And so now the problem. I said I'm going to talk about sustainable infrastructure as the foundation for all civil society. So first off, um, what do we mean by infrastructure? It can mean many things. Uh, what I mean when I say it are large, horizontal things made out of concrete and steel usually. So sewers, roads, um, airports and, that serve our sewers and our roads and our transportation and our transit. I don't tend to mean things like ferries or um, electronic communications. Lots of other people would call those infrastructure. That's not what I say when I mean it. And then if we're talking about sustainability, um, and I put this picture in for the people I was talking to over lunch, what does that mean? It means having a limited amount of resources, but a high enough quality of life. And ideally, we want all the countries in the world to have a high human development um, index, but a low environmental footprint, and live in this box. And these are all of the measured countries, so you can see how we're doing on a getting to this box. So lots of these countries need to come up, get a higher development index without using more resources. And lots of these countries, which is where we all live, need to come down without falling out of the box in a way that would be intolerable. And so the question that I'm working with is how can we use infrastructure to come down this line, maintain a quality of life without experiencing a loss? Because people will fight that loss hand tooth and now. And so if we can achieve that through infrastructure, we can, um, then we can give people the quality of life they need without you know, making the planet uninhabitable. So foundation of civil society. How many of you engaged in at least one of these activities today? Okay, if the, if, <laughs> yes, 
right? So you woke up this morning. I hope you brushed your teeth. Uh, to do that, you may have turned on the lights. So you called on the infrastructure system to do that. That would not have been possible without the infrastructure system, unless any, somebody here lives completely off-grid generating their own electricity, which I suspect at the moment not. Um, we won't go into the details of going to the bathroom, but it, requi it requires water and also infrastructure and electricity in many cases that came through pipes that were part of the infrastructure system, treated in water plants that were part of the infrastructure system. Coffee and tea requires energy and again, liquids. Your house was heated, that's part of the infrastructure system. You charged your phone today, that's part of the infrastructure system. You got here somehow. Um, either you drove or you took transit or you walked or you biked. No matter how you came here, you engaged with the transportation infrastructure system. And then it's warm in this room, so again, we're relying on the distributed infrastructure system that makes our life possible. So we would not have been able to have this conversation. You would all have terrible dental hygiene. Nobody would have been able to go to the bathroom successfully in a city if we didn't have the infrastructure system. It's completely foundational to every single thing we do. And it means that we can sometimes take it for granted, but if you think for a minute about what your life would have been like this morning if you didn't have water coming out of your taps, you immediately can get a visceral sense of, oh, somebody here didn't have water this morning. It sounds, <laughs> you look great. Um, <laughs> but we also know this intuitively in other ways. So if these are um, equal scale maps of the road network in different cities. Have you seen these before? Okay, somebody has. So if you look at just these maps of the road network, which are a beautiful expression of the infrastructure system, you get a sense of what type of cities there are and what type of activities are going on. So first off, which one of these do you think is the car do most car dominated? Yeah. The okay, the middle, but also the top one. The middle one, it's very straight streets. It's easy to drive. It's not gonna, be, their streets are fairly wide. In the top left-hand corner, uh, the blocks are wide, so if you think if you wanted to walk from one place to another, you'd have to walk down a very large block. And you can kind of imagine in a city like this, without even knowing where it is, that it would be a nice place to wander around, it would be interesting, you'd, there's probably a lot of cafes where you can have croissants and a cappuccino, right? That's pretty clearly in Europe. And you can take other guesses about this. So, right, which one of these are in North America? The, the diagonal. Would, yeah, middle one. Yeah, the middle one is in, North, is in North America. This one is too, so is that one. But we can get a sense of what kind of city these are and what kind of place it is to live just by looking at the street network without knowing anything else about it. And when you put the labels on, oh, this fell off, but this is Toronto, that's New York, that's Mississauga, and then the ones that look like they're in Europe are in Europe. And it's because we have an inherent expression of a city of what a place is like to live based on how we've allocated space to streets, what those streets are like. And in North America, the reason we have a different view of our streets is because we designed them for different a different way of life. Whereas these streets were designed for people to walk around or maybe ride a horse. Our streets were designed for people to move quickly and fast in a large, um, in a large armored vehicle, basically. Um, and I don't mean actually armored, just, you know, armored. Um, something to keep in mind when we're thinking about infrastructure is also that it's accelerating. More and more of the world is becoming an infrastructure space. And this is happening really quickly because as we develop and as we ha gain higher quality of life mixed with the fact that we have more population on the planet, we're building more infrastructure everywhere. So this, um, these are nighttime satellite photos of uh, India in 1994 and in 2010. And what you see is that in 2010 it's way brighter. And nighttime satellite photos of light are used as a proxy for infrastructure study um, from space because it's a really good indication of where built up areas happening, where infrastructure has already happened. And this is happening all over the world. So in the scale of your lifetimes, you were, oh no, this isn't quite, you guys are really young. This isn't quite your lifetime, but even on the scale of 2000 to 2019, which is about your lifetime, the scale of infrastructure in the planet is astronomical. We will build more in the next 15, 20 years than has ever been built before in all of history. So the amount of infrastructure we're putting on the planet is massive. And we're transitioning from a space where we have two ecosystems on the planet, one natural, one man-made, to where we have one eco on the system on the planet that's all man-made, human-made. So this is an example, it's the water infrastructure system in Arizona. 
And so you might think there are rivers in Arizona, those are governed by the natural environment. There are water pipes in Arizona, those are governed by humans. But even the rivers are governed by the natural environment in Arizona. So in this picture, you can see everywhere there's a pumping station on a river. And how much water flows in that river is completely controlled by humans. We have made the natural environment part of our infrastructure system, both on purpose and by accident. And then finally, while many of this is in the back end, we know um, we notice the moment it goes wrong. So this top one is ones you will have lived through. These are the floodings from the summer. Was anybody here this summer when the city flooded? So the city flooded in the summer, and you couldn't go anywhere, right? The infrastructure system broke down, life broke down. For many people, it was a funny inconvenience. You stayed home, you watched a movie. But for a lot of people, it was a disastrous inconvenience. If you happened to be trying to drive under that tunnel about the same time as that streetcar, your car got flooded. It's funny, but if you couldn't get out of your car, it was also really dangerous. And for a few days after that, you get a lot of press coverage. Is Toronto maintaining its infrastructure system? Is our infrastructure system up to the challenge of the 21st century? And then the press coverage goes away because it stops raining, their streets stop being flooded, and so we move on. We experience failures of the infrastructure system every time we have to drive. Uh, because if you're sitting in a freeway, in a highway, moving really fast, parked completely still, your system is failing you. It's a transportation system that's not moving you anywhere. And then these ones happened in my um, youth and early universities, so you may not remember them. Have you heard of the Walkerton scandal? So in the late 1990s, there was a water treatment plant failure in Walkerton, and a lot of people died. And people are still dying because the E. coli poisoning that caused that scandal can kill people over the long time. Nobody in Walkerton, just like we don't think about it, had expected that their water system could fail. But a combination of a lack of government investment and interest in infrastructure and particular incompetence of two people working at that water treatment plant, people got very, very sick. It was a noticeable failure of the system. Um, does anybody notice anything missing from North America in this picture? New York, Toronto, the whole eastern seaboard. So that was 2003. Um, electricity went down, it was a huge blackout. I was in Toronto that day, I was supposed to be driving back to university the next day with my family, and it was mostly funny because it was the middle of the summer, we didn't really need the electricity that day, and it only was, the lights were only down for about 24 hours. People went to bars, bars put out candles, every, lots of people had a good time, but if it had kept going for more than, than a day, it could have um, caused panic in the city. So we really notice when it goes wrong. Um, so I'm going to switch from talking about infrastructure in general to transportation infrastructure in specific. I hope that I've successfully convinced you that infrastructure is a really important foundation of general functioning of life. And we're going to take this one step further as transportation infrastructure as the foundation for all infrastructure. So this is the conclusion I'm going to try and convince you of. Transportation infrastructure is the basis. We put everything else on top of the decisions we made about that, and we will never achieve sustainability if we don't wrestle with our transportation problem. One of the fun things about being someone who researches transportation is that everybody has an opinion. Um, you all experience transportation infrastructure today. I bet everybody in this room could tell me how they feel about the TTC. Um, or about bike lanes or about congestion. It makes me a weird kind of very popular at parties because everybody wants to tell me their feelings about the transportation infrastructure system. Um, they don't necessarily like to hear mine in response, but you know, working on it. This is a real protest, this is not a joke. These are people who were protesting bike lanes um, rather aggressively. And you see, it's funny, that's not in Toronto, but we see these types of reactions. People are very sensitive about transportation infrastructure space, and we consider a change, or many people consider a change as a theft. We're stealing from something from them that was rightfully their, theirs. And we are having um, a to-be-concluded discussion about what public space means in, in cities, how to allocate it, and what's important. And I think the following 15 slides, um, should be taken into account when we have that discussion. So the first thing that we all know intuitively is that what transportation infrastructure exists determines what choices you can make. So if you woke up this morning and you lived two minutes away from the university by foot, you walked here because that was the most sense. You weren't gonna get in a car, drive 10 minutes farther away from your house, park, and then walk back. It would have been a nonsensical choice. 
But if you lived far away, maybe you lived um, near Eglinton subway station, you probably came here by subway. But you lived even farther away and you didn't have the choice to walk because it would have taken you an hour and a half and it's slippery and you needed to be here at nine this morning because you have to attend three lectures today. And um, maybe you couldn't take the TTC because you didn't leave, live near a station and it would have taken you three buses and the bus only comes every 15 minutes. So we know that it precipitates your choice. So that one's easy. But then the choices that we decide about transfer, what transportation to choose um, dictated in large part to us by the infrastructure made available has a huge income um, output of lots of the things we care about, uh, like greenhouse gas emissions. So greenhouse gas emissions in the Toronto region are about a third right now of our overall greenhouse gas emissions and increasing. We see lots of places where the greenhouse gas emissions from transportation, just from the operating of cars, is 50% of the emissions. It's even bigger in Ontario. And as time goes on, we're getting, our buildings are becoming more efficient and our transportation is not because we tend to be driving more by ourselves, driving farther and driving farther in big cars. If we don't reduce those trends, we will never achieve the 1.5 or 2 degree scenarios of climate change, which are what we need to reduce the most catastrophic impacts. And this blue, this is a breakdown of the world's greenhouse gas emissions by travel mode. Blue is cars. So basically, this is a problem of cars. If you don't care about climate change, you probably care about health and lung disease. Um, and transportation is a big driver of that. So this is a picture of transport smog. Um, if you haven't seen that in Toronto, it's in part because you grew up in the 2000s, but it existed in the 80s and 90s. And if you've traveled in other cities, you've definitely seen it. But this is a map of modern black carbon in Toronto, which is a dangerous respiratory pollutant. And where it's high, where it's red, which is well above um, health guideline levels, is along busy transportation corridors where lots of people are driving. And it's a big determinant of equity. So this is a map of universities and students to, um, coming to universities in this region from the student travel study that was done a couple years ago. And what this research was showing, this is one example of equity, is that people who have less access to transit have less success at university. They choose their courses so they're more closely grouped together so they don't have to travel as much. And uh, university success is highly correlated with time spent on campus. And if you can't get on campus because of your transport um, challenges, it's harder to have sex success in university. If you have a hard time getting here, statistics are not individually accurate. So this does not mean you are not going to have success, it just means on average it is harder. So I'm not telling you, you're all, you know, it's all over because you live far from campus. There are lots of other determinants of equity, this is one example, but transport access is a key determiner of health and wealth and opportunities. If we can switch people's travel behavior, from instance from cars to, to transit, we can get huge wins. Um, the infrastructure we build not only gives people opportunities, but it also forces them to make specific choices. And in transport, we're very sensitive to supply and demand. So if you build a new lane of highway, it doesn't make traffic any better. It just has more people clogged up on that extra lane of highway. This also works for autonomous cars. If we get autonomous cars and they can all drive closer together so that everything moves faster, the most likely outcome is that more people will drive and everything will move slower again. So if anyone ever tells you autonomous cars are gonna solve congestion, tell them about induced demand. They may not believe you, but they will be wrong. Um, induced demand also works for bicycles. So, and for transit. If you put in a bike lane, we get very surprised by how many new people use it. The new bike lanes on Adelaide have had an 1,000% growth in biking along that street. Um, the great quote about biking is you can't tell how many people will use a bridge by how many people are swimming across the river. Um, so just because people aren't biking doesn't mean people wouldn't bike. The majority of people in this region say they would bike, but they only want to do it in places that are safe. So we've got transportation infrastructure driving how we move, how um, our health and pollution is, our equity access, but it also is a huge consumer of materials. And as we live in an increasingly material constrained world, um, we need to be thinking about how we're using materials. In many countries, about 50% of overall concrete use goes into our infrastructure system. And like we're putting more um, infrastructure down, 
That means we're putting a lot more concrete on the earth. That means less natural land. It means less forested land. It means more concrete reflecting heat back to the sun. Uh, so it's, an, it, it's a compounding problem. This also goes for rail. We use lots and lots of materials to build rail, not just roads, uh, which is part of the reason why I said at the beginning in my PhD research, it's a huge opportunity, but there's a big expense, and so we need to take advantage of that opportunity. Then we have to maintain our infrastructure. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit to, it also determines the overall shape of our city. So we talked about this implicitly when we were looking at the maps, and we could tell that all the cities were a little bit different. But the size of cities over time has grown in relation to their transportation infrastructure. So when everybody was walking everywhere, cities could only be about as big as people could walk from one place to another, approximately an hour from one side to the other. Otherwise, it made no sense because you would be walking from two hours, two hours to get where you're going, and that's not an agglomeration of people living together. That would be two separate cities. And so we had walk-based cities, then we had horse-based cities, then we started getting the first suburbs, which were streetcar related, and then we got cars, and the cities got much bigger. And again, autonomous cars, if they happen, are likely to do this. So the overall size and shape of our cities has been influenced by our dominant transportation infrastructure for a long time. And this is a figure of how that happens. You have transportation infrastructure. It gives us access newly to a place. We build some stuff in that place. People want to go to the stuff, so they use the transportation infrastructure. Place gets busy. We want more transportation infrastructure. And you repeat the cycle. But not only does it govern the overall shape of our city, it governs what types of things we put in it. So if we have a system where everyone has to drive, it means everyone needs somewhere to put their car. So we have to give lots of space for the car. You need to garages behind houses, beside houses so people can store them. And so now not only do we have a size of a city governed by transportation infrastructure, we also have what we put into that city. Um, and that has big impacts on material use and greenhouse gas emissions per person. A low density area, which is what you get when you have a road dominated transportation system, has both more energy use and material use per person, the blue, in terms of cars and travel, but it also has more energy use and material use per person on all other metrics. You tend to have a bigger house. It takes more energy to heat that house. You have a bigger house, so you fill it with stuff. Um, you know, I suspect that those of you who live alone are unlikely to have four fridges and six TVs, but if you had a 4,000 square foot house, you might feel at one point, well, the fridge is too far, I need another one over here. And these impacts are really, really long term. This is a piece of research that came out last year, which may be one of my all time favorite pieces of transport infrastructure research. And they found that Roman roads, so built by the Romans, are still predictive of prosperity in Europe. So decisions about what infrastructure to invest in and where by the Romans are having meaningful outcomes now. So when you're playing in the infrastructure space, you're playing for keeps and for a long time. Okay, and the reason I picked transportation among all the infrastructure systems is our transportation corridors are where we put everything else. So inside a road, you're gonna have a sewer, you have the telephone cables, you have electricity cables, you have the gas mains, all of that runs around the transportation corridor. Um, I mentioned in the beginning that I worked on Billy Bishop Tunnel. So the tunnel that you walk through to get to that airport is only one of seven or eight tunnels built to build that tunnel. The roof of that was made with a human um, boring machine about as big as I am that built, uh, drilled individual tunnels. I think it was about seven to form the roof. And most of those were filled in with concrete to make an arch that supports the roof of, roof of that tunnel. But two of them have utility pipes running through them because since we were building a corridor, we could run utility pipes. You, it always happens like this with transportation infrastructure. Once you do one, everything else tends to follow. And we talked about this a little bit implicitly, but where and how we build our transportation infrastructure also governs how much natural land we have available to us, how much farmland we have available to us. So this is a map starting in, uh, see that it's quite blurry, starting with brown being built older and green being built newer of how the city of Toronto developed. So downtown Toronto here was built in the late 19th century. And then the city expanded out from there radi radially as time went on. And you might think, we needed to expand that far to accommodate all of those people. In 1920 in Toronto, there was half a million people. They all lived south of St. Clair. Right? So that half a million people were all in this area right here. I'm too short for the projector. 
Um, we now have about two and a half million people in the city. So we have five times as many people and way more than five times as much space. And we also have vertical buildings and height they never had at the time. So the city in 1920 was much denser and more efficiently used than we are now. It's not that we needed this much space to accommodate 2.7 million people. It was that we chose to do it this way in large part because we were designing around roads and around cars. And all of that blue and green was not that long ago farmland and wildland. And the difference in what I've seen beyond this, just in my lifetime, of what it means, like if you drive up the 401 when I was a kid, that was farmland and a place to go hiking. And now it's subdivision, subdivision, subdivision until you get to Barry. That has major impacts on the structure of society in terms of equity, in terms of social exclusion, in terms of economic opportunities, and has a huge environmental impacts. And so this is one of the major challenges that we're focus facing in the infrastructure system. Around transportation infrastructure, we have 100 years of mistakes. And a lot of what we did in the 20th century was not productive for long-term viability. And I love this figure because we know how to do this. We've done it well. We don't need new technology for this. We don't need new ideas. What we need is how, knowledge on how to apply the old ideas well and efficiently and adapted to the 21st century. We don't need a new, new invention, but it's exceptionally hard to do this, as hard as you can imagine one person pushing back a major concrete road. So these are two quotes that I really um, respect from some colleagues at Cambridge about the challenges of the infrastructure system and the role of engineers. We have to be engaged in these topics. They're huge, they require our expertise, and we need more people to be taking them on. And it may sound, I know one of the perspectives of infrastructure and especially of civil engineering can be that it's a little bit state. You know, this is old engineering, we built the pyramids, we built the Colosseum. It was cool for antiquities, but not that cool for the 21st century. Um, I disagree. But even if the things that you want to do are play with drones, computer models, um, we do that all of that in infrastructure engineering. So some research run by a colleague of mine, Brenda McCabe, who researches tall buildings, they're using drones for construction management. In my research, we're using compu computer programs and machine learning and uh, talking about computer vision all the time. These things that are tools are powerful, but tools need a problem. Uh, and so you can specialize in a tool, you can, but you have to apply it to a problem. I have a really big problem. And in addition to all of these tools, you also need systems thinking. So if you heard the joke of the elephant, you get a whole bunch of um, blind people to feel different parts of the elephant, and one of them feels the trunk and says, oh, the elephant's sort of squishy, and one of them feels the foot and says, oh, the elephant uh, feels kind of like resin, right? Different people feel different part of the elephant, because they're only feeling one part, they get no sense of what an elephant actually is. So you need systems thinking. You need to be able to see and feel the whole elephant or talk to other people who see and feel the whole elephant. Um, does anybody watch The Good Place? Okay, you've seen the most recent episode. Well, I'm gonna ruin it a little bit for you. Um, one of the things they came up with is part of the reason that people aren't getting enough points is because the implications of all of our decisions have gotten really complicated. So even just choosing a tomato, you can be engaged with slavery, pesticides, environmental degradation. And they take this to the judge, and the judge says, that's the human problem. They should do their research. They need to do a better job. And so even on the good place, not being a systems thinker is literally sending you to hell. So I would <laughs> encourage you to take up that challenge. So with the last few minutes, I'll tell you a little bit about my research. Three of my ongoing projects are all, they're all looking at the infrastructure system, some at the project scale, some at the city scale, and some looking at infrastructure across time. So a lot of my research stems or sits in an area of intellectual inquiry called industrial ecology, which is where you think of industrial systems as a type of ecosystem or as a type of organism. And so you think about all of the inputs that come into the system, the things that build up in the system, and all of the exports that come out of the system. So one of the classic ones, for instance, might of thinking about um, inputs, storage, and outputs is the human body. You put in food, you store fat and muscle, you output feces. 
So the cities and industrial systems do that too. City pulls in construction materials. We store those construction materials in the city in forms of buildings and infrastructure. We output waste and emissions. You can do that at the project scale, you can do it at the city scale, you can do it at the factory scale. So I use this to think about transportation infrastructure. And if we think of the inputs to transportation infrastructure, all of the early stages, you have to manufacture the original materials, then you have to use energy to get those materials to site and put on site. You have to tear down whatever was in your way in the first place, if that's old infrastructure or it could have been natural land. You have to deal with the, um, with the disruption of your construction process. Then you have to maintain your infrastructure system which is a direct maintenance impact, but then there's all kinds of indirect impacts we've already talked about, like travel behavior change, land use change, long-term um, land use allocation change between forests, farmland, and natural land, and then eventually your system wears out and you have to maintain it or replace it. We tend not to ever fully tear out transportation infrastructure. Those Roman roads have been around for thousands of years. The oldest um, public transit subway in the world is in London. It's been around for 150 years. They're still running in all the same places. So one of the key questions that I'm asking in my research is, how do we use materials and energy in building individual infrastructure projects, and where are the opportunities to do better? And there's a tension in this type of research in between time and knowledge. So infrastructure systems are one-off. We only build them once. So the exact opposite of what Brett said yesterday in his talk, we're just push it out and then iterate, that doesn't work for us. If, imagine if we just pushed out an entire subway system and then said, oh, sorry, we just learned from you that this isn't really the right approach. We're going to tear it out, and in 30 years, you'll have a new one. Um, it's just a different scale of engagement. So at the end, when we're done, when the project is over, we have a pretty good idea of what we built, but at that point we can't change anything, or it would be very, very hard to change it. At the beginning, when we have a huge amount of opportunity to decide, we have not that much information at our, about the current project, because we haven't designed it yet, we haven't built it, and it's, it takes a long time and a lot of human capital and a lot of physical capital to build something from start to finish. And so we don't tend to uh, just build two things, test them, or even just design two things and decide which is right. We make big decisions at the beginning. So this research is working to give us enough information using our existing projects and example to inform early stage decisions. So one of the things we've looked at is what's the overall impact specifically of uh, public transportation infrastructure. One of the things we found, it depends on if you're building below ground or above ground. So if you're gonna build a rail line, should you build it below or above ground? And one of the things we found is that building below ground is 27 times more material intensive. And so if you're gonna do that, which we should do in many instances, we need to expect a 27 times more return on environmental investment than if we were gonna build above ground. We've also been using building information models, so fancy 3D um, software, to look at how good are we at predicting greenhouse gas emissions based on our current best practice. And one of the things we found is, this is what you would assess if you just take the tech approach, and this is probably what actually happened based on better data. So we have to be really careful about just going down the tech route, because we're gonna be wrong by probably more than 50%. And if we based our infrastructure decisions on that information alone, those decisions would then be wrong by more than 50%. And so going from this, started scaling up to the whole city, figuring if we can do assessments of material use and greenhouse gas impact on one project, why not do all the projects? And so we're looking at material use for every single piece of infrastructure in every single building in the entire city and the implications of that. And those implications are environmental, all the materials we use have pollution with them. They're also social. Different parts of the city are getting allocated different amounts of material use per person, and they're economic. We have to maintain all of the infrastructure we put in. So we're using something called material flow analysis, which is a good, basically how I explain industrial ecology. You look at how materials flow into the system, how they build out in the system, and how materials flow out of the system. And so we're de dealing with detailed maps of the city's infrastructure system, and all of the records that the city releases on construction work so that we know how the system is changing over time. Um, one of my current students, who's an NSCI thesis student, 
has compiled all of the construction being done in the city, run by the city of Toronto for an 18 month period, has mapped it all and all the different types, and is starting to analyze that and all of the material needs for his thesis. And then I've got another NSI th uh, thesis student, not infrastructure, he's from the machine learning stream, which I know is not called that, but close enough, looking at all of the buildings in the city. So this is a 3D model of all of the buildings in the city, and this is two models laid on top of each other. So we have 2013 and 2018. And in part from the model, we can tell how um, buildings are building up in the city, which we can use to predict how materials are building up in the city over time. And some of the models are quite detailed. So for instance, that is the Myhill Center, which is across the street. And so well, the final project we're gonna talk about is infrastructure timelines. Infrastructure takes a long time to build, and it's really easy to be frustrated about that. And um, especially when talking to rooms of students, sometimes people say things like, well, why don't we just push it through and build it? Why don't we take basically a dictatorial approach of this is the infrastructure we need and we should just build it? And while that, of course, sounds very tempting if you're going to elect me benevolent dictator, it's in tension with our democratic systems, which requires engagement and discussion. And so the research question that we're tackling this in a partnership in between civil engineering, geography, and the infrastructure planning department at the University College London is there's an imperative for speed, but there's also a tension of ideas need time to develop. And the, you can't necessarily have both. If you rush through something, the idea might be immature, but if you let the idea mature ad nauseum, it'll take a really long time to build infrastructure. So we started by asking two questions. One, how long does it take us to deliver infrastructure? Starting with an idea, somebody says we should build the downtown relief line or it starts showing up in planning reports all the way to the day it opens. How does that vary again across infrastructure types? What's causing us to be fast or slow? And then in the times where we go slow, are we taking advantage of that time to improve the idea? So these are some of the timelines of the, that we've looked at so far. Um, the, each line represents a project, and where it starts at the beginning is the first time someone said publicly we should build this or it showed up in a planning report. And then we have after that an inception phase, which is where it gets covered in the press, we all chat about it, but basically we don't do anything about it, we're just chatting to each other about the infrastructure. Eventually some real uh, dedication happens or some money gets allocated, you go into the planning phase, then we have to go through regulatory things like the environmental assessment, Eventually we start building it and then we open it. And you can see, I think it's pretty clear, that in many of these the planning phase is really, really long. So these projects started in 1959 and opened, um, well one of them's not even open yet. So it opened about now, give or take two or three years. So that's a really long time. If you lived near where one of these projects was going to be built in 1959 and you felt like, oh, a project is coming, you might be pretty pissed off that it you know, took your entire lifetime. Your grandchildren got to see it, but it was nowhere near. So hopefully you hold, held on to the family home. Now it is right near a subway station or is about to be in another three years. And uh, this is a little bit outside the realm of civil engineering, but there's rumblings that this type of thing is feeding into populism because if your government is promising you major life-changing infrastructure and never delivering on it, you're more inclined to think, well, let's just overthrow the government. It doesn't matter which party, they, both, they all promised this and nobody delivered. And so there's a danger in the way we deal with our infrastructure system is undermining that democracy. That hunger for the benevolent dictator can also lead to the not benevolent dictator who just says they're gonna get things done. And so, well, the second question in this research, after how long does things take, was are the long-term projects benefiting from this extension in time? So this is the Eglinton Crosstown, as we see it today, which was one of the projects I worked on when I was a consultant. And this is a plan from 1985 called the Network 2011 Plan. Um, if you're a transportation nerd, you'll know the irony of that project, because basically we built none of it, and it was all supposed to be done by 2011. And that project was actually started and it was canceled by the previous um, conservative government. So they started, they had shovels in the ground, they filled the hole back in because of political priorities about what the, what the province should be spending money on or not spending money on. So then the question becomes, is that project different from this one? They're both transit lines along Eglinton. 
did we benefit from the extra 20 years in between that one and this one to make it better? And I think that question is dubious. In some of their case studies, it's clearly no. The project is exactly the same. It's been on the books since 65, and it doesn't look any different. This one, the project got longer. We changed technology. It's going to be light rail instead of heavy rail, though it'll still be underground in most of the city. A lot of the stops are exactly the same, but some of the stops are different. And so in some parts of the city where the stops were the same, there's been no benefit to this 25-year delay. In some parts of the city, maybe there has been, but it becomes an important question. And overall, from our projects, what we're seeing is we build road projects really fast, rail projects really slow, and we're not benefiting enough from our long-term hesitancy to do things. And so what we need is not to build things willy-nilly by dictator, but to find a pathway forward where we don't talk about ideas forever without acting on them, in large part because we have a very hard time investing money in large transit projects in our region. Okay, so so what? Um, part of the reason I'm here today is to pitch you on infrastructure as a place to spend interesting time. So why did I tell you all of this? Um, first, because infrastructure problems are completely fundamental. They are the baseline of how we all go about our daily life. Um, they're also less. You know, you want to work on the biggest hardest things that are going to you know, secure your legacy for a long period of time, build these things. Um, apps are cool, robots are cool, they will not outlive you. All the infrastructure projects that I build on, but I worked on will. Um, infrastructure engineers literally build the future. So what we put down on the grounds um, creates the city that comes later. And making a choice to do nothing also creates the city that comes later. So either way, we are generating the future through our choices or not our non-choices. And many of the biggest challenges of our, era, of our era are infrastructure challenges. So climate change, health change, equity change, those have major infrastructure levers that need to be pulled and not enough people who are engaging with those questions or how to deal with these very big, very complex, wicked problems. And so, I'm going to talk about this a little bit. So this is from a report written in the 1970s by the Club of Rome, who were some of the first people to talk about resource limitations and environmental degradation on Earth. Um, people didn't take them very seriously, and they're now seen as, in many ways, the foundation of the modern sustainability discussion. And so what they are talking about in this graph is the different time scales and group scales that people can think about. So this is next week, next few years, life, our lifetime and our children's lifetime. And up this graph, we have your family, your business city or neighborhood, your race or nation, and the world. And everybody thinks about these problems, which are this week and for their family. And then fewer people think about the next few years in their neighborhood. Very few people think about problems of their lifetime at the national scale. But when we're talking about problems of our lifetime and our kids' game, time, lifetime at the global scale, very few people think about those problems. And part of it is because thinking about those problems is a luxury. You can't think about lifetime or multi-lifetime global problems if you have problems with your basic needs being met. If you have shelter problems or food problems, or if your life is literally unsafe, you don't have the privilege to be thinking about these problems. But we here, many of us, and I can't presume to know the stage of your stability and what needs you have met, but Personally, I'm pretty good, right? I know where I'm going to sleep this week. I have a great employer. Um, I have clean clothes as long as I do the laundry. I'm okay. And so I have the luxury and the privilege to think and work on big, complex, long-term problems. And so I think that as, especially from this university, where many of us have that luxury, we have the privilege to get to choose to do that instead of getting to choose to work on this year right now for me. And so I would challenge some of you to do that, to say it's hard, it takes a long time, they're huge problems to conceive of, they're very, very complex, in many ways the definition of wicked problems, but it's a privilege to work on them that very few people get to make that choice. So that being said, if you're interested, my group is really fun, and uh, we take interns in the summer, um, I'm not 100% sure what the interns will be doing this year, but I will definitely be hiring, and I would love to see strong applications from NSI. 
Uh, and we go out and do fun things sometimes, and just that is me flying headfirst in the back into the foam. Uh, so that's, that's it for me. I'll open it up for any questions. Um, thank you for coming today, Professor. We really appreciate it. I'm Yezo Zaman, a first year SI student. Um, so um, I, was, I was very interested in the integration that you had between infrastructure and machine intelligence and all of uh, the, the, the integration between infrastructure and like new technologies. Mm -hmm. So what do you believe is there some sort of integration between I infrastructure and renewable energy sources. So how can we integrate both of these fields together in order to ensure that there is a sustainable future? Okay, so the question was, how does infrastructure and renewable energy work together? So I think it depends what you mean by renewable energy. Um, I mean, in the province of Ontario, most of our electricity system is already, depends how you define renewable, but at least decarbonized. Um, we have nuclear, water, uh, hydro, and a lot of solar and wind electricity. Lot, most of that is done at the utility scale. It's done at the infrastructure scale. So um, we can have distributed, do you mean distributed renewable energy, so like solar panels on people's roofs? Um, so I would actually say that distributed energy is not the solution. And while it's useful in some cases, I don't think it's the way to deal with energy problems in cities for a couple of reasons. One, cities are, by definition, a place where lots of people live together. For lots of people to live together functionally, they need to live vertically, um, or at least a lot of people need to live vertically. Solar energy breaks down in that situation because you don't have enough roof space per person. Also, as people move to distributed sources of energy, like for instance, anyone who has a house starts putting solar panels on their roof, they start destabilizing the energy grid. The grid needs to, needs to be able to balance across many people and needs peop many people paying in for it to, to work. It's the definition of the commons, right? We all have to invest in it together for it to work and it only works when we all do it reasonably. Um, sorry, not commons, civic contract. And as people start opting out of the infrastructure system, it, uh, it doesn't mean we need less infrastructure, it just means there's less people to pay for it. So what gets left works less well, then more people opt out, like what gets left works less well, and more people opt out. And all you have at the end of who's left, if you follow that to its logical conclusion, is people who can't afford to opt out, or can't opt out, because they live in a vertical environment where they don't have enough solar energy per person. And so that would either mean you could no longer live in a vertical environment, which tears down the cities, or it would mean we would be disproportionately putting the weight of our infrastructure system on our most vulnerable populations. So while solar panels and batteries are interesting technology, and we're great in rural environments, right, we shouldn't run wires and infrastructure systems all the way out for a small number of people, in cities, they both don't work at scale and can be destructive for things that do. Okay, so the question was, um, where, for big infrastructure, should it be the public doing it or the private com doing it? Where's the tension going on there and could I comment on sidewalk? So let me take that in stages, starting with the public and the private. The public has a very specific role to fill and private has something very specific to fill. Private companies, by definition, are seeking a reasonable profit. Even very good companies with the most ethical basis and the best leaders have to seek a reasonable profit. Our government does not. So the government should be providing anything that we consider a civic good that isn't going to be profit making, like much of our transportation system. If it's something that should be profit making and can be justly profit making, then it can sit in the private sector. I think lots of our infrastructure system, for instance, like a uh, subway system, doesn't make sense in the private sector because for it to be functional, it doesn't work at a level that makes profit every single year, and so we need to be subsidized by the government anyway, and if it's being subsidized by the government, it shouldn't be run for the benefit of private interest, it should be run for the benefit of public interest. That being said, there are ways to work together. So subway stations, 
have air on top of them. We can sell those air rights for money. And some places do that really well. And we should do it because it's a positive feedback loop in a good way. The people who live on top of the subway station and the businesses that own there give value to the subway station because now there's lots of people to come to that subway station to go up into the building. And similarly, the subway station gives value to the building because that building now has good transit connection. And so the public wins by having the money for selling the air rights and the private sector wins by having really good connections. So those types of public-private partnerships can work really well and I think it's something we should do more of in Toronto but we should not be handing over the operation, in my opinion, of public goods which are for the benefit of the public to private companies which are mandated to make a profit. So then talking about sidewalk. So if we talk about sidewalk, I think there's a reasonable question to ask, right? They are a private company. They eventually need to make money, right? We can all admit that. I don't think they're trying to hide it. They have to make money. There's a question if they have to make money on this project because it could just be a showpiece that they're willing to lose money on to make money later. But if they have to make money, then the question becomes, what are they going to make money on? And if the thing they're going to make money on is data, then the question for us is, are we comfortable trading some sort of they give us stuff for we give them data? And so we don't have to put up the money up front to build infrastructure or to build affordable housing. They'll do it for us. But what we sold them was our data. And if that's a trade that we're comfortable with, then fine, we should go for it. We're selling them our data because we don't want to pay for things ourselves. But I think we should not be in that situation all up in arms that Google wants to sell our data, that they're trying to make money. Of course they're trying to make money. That is their job. If we want a situation where people deliver public goods and don't try and make money, that's what the government is for. And then we shouldn't be starving the government of the funds it needs to deliver on those services. And I think we live in, um, we haven't reconciled those truths. I think it's very common for us to both demand that things are given to us for no cash and no upfront investment, but also be horrified that we then have to pay for it in some other way. And that we need to have that discussion, we need to face up to it. I would rather have higher taxes and pay for the infrastructure I need for the benefit of all than sell things by accident or implicitly or over the long term. I think there's lots of interesting things about the sidewalk project, so I'm not specifically in that case, but I would rather have higher taxes and a better transit system than lower taxes and have a private company deliver what should be public goods. Okay, so the question was, given that the first years are not able to choose the infrastructure option, if they're interested in infrastructure, what other of the options might they choose that could lead them to this path? So first off, I'm really sorry about that one. I very much wish the infrastructure option had continued. Um, I arrived just as they were shutting it down, and I was like, you know I'm an infrastructure specialist, and they were like, it's too late, it's done. Um, so I think that so I'm not familiar with all of the infrastructure options, but I think, sorry, all the NSI options, but I would suggest one of the skill-based ones. So data science or probably machine learning. Are there any skill-based ones that I'm missing? Math, stats, and science. Math, is that different than data science? We don't have data. Oh, it's math, stats, and, sci and finance. Yes. <laughs>
So the energy major is actually fantastic. Um, so we looked into that and as um, uh, Professor Sapp said, um, you know, if you want to look at tools that can be applied, definitely you can go to machine learning and learning. Thank you. That's a much better answer than I was giving. And I should clarify the conversation I had with, with about the infrastructure uh, option going away was within civil engineering, not with engineering science. Um, and I was being a little bit tongue in cheek, but by no means <laughs> anything no, intended. Yeah. Yet. I didn't want anyone to feel like I just let them down, right? Uh, you know, media, so yeah. 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 Um, yes. So um, I think def and energy is a great suggestion. The, part of the reason I said the skill based options, um, and not that I think the other ones aren't skill based, but those ones are like not about a specific problem, they're about skills specifically is that um, I know lots of people, for instance, do machine learning and do data science, and I work with some people who do them. And every once in a while in my career, I've had conversations with someone in data science, a specialist who says something to me like, what are your data processing needs? And I, I, what I always say to them is getting the data. Can you help me with that one? Because getting the data in the field is hard. And what they have are skills, but they, need a, they often come to us and say, what's your problem? So I can give you a problem if you can bring me skills. And I also spend a lot of my life working on getting the data. And if we can put those two things together, um, engineering science students, in my experience, are amazingly talented and bright and can pick up fundamentals of things really quickly if they're interested and hungry. And so from energy or from mass statistics, and, some, and a third one, um, or machine learning, uh, I think there are lots of great things we could do. And I would definitely happily recruit students from those backgrounds, given their interests and alignment and all of those things. Um, given that the GPA is currently trending by um, having these families move more north, um, there's not really a lot of infrastructure, per se, like laying, being laid down. Like, there's like small, like major big roads Okay, so I don't know Stouffville that well, um, or really at all, so I can't comment specifically on Stouffville. But to a community that was building anew, uh, I think there are many questions we could ask. Uh, one of which is at the macro level, is new places without infrastructure, is that the right place to put lots of people? Um, so one of the things we can do that's very efficient is encourage people to live where there's already infrastructure. Right? If we're turning undeveloped land into new housing, if we're putting down new sewers and new roads, then we're al already doing all kinds of unsustainable things. So that's, that's one. So the question is, do we need to do this? If we do, then there are lots of ways to build human scale, really livable places that um, are, have light but communal infrastructure. So, you can build bike lanes, you can build stacked townhouses, uh, you can have community centers that are schools, and you can bind things together. But my general advice to a place would be have a cordon, so decide how big your space is, and stay within it as much as possible. Because for every extra 500 meters outside your cordon of your city you go, you have to build that much more sewer and that much more road and service it with a fire truck and have schools for those people. And all of that is hugely resource intensive, both in terms of the environment and in terms of money. And this is a problem we've seen a lot with development in terms of the region, is that in some ways, some of our development has been a Ponzi scheme. And I can't believe I said that on something that is recorded, but I'm going to go with it. So um, the way a Ponzi scheme works is to pay off the original investors, you have to keep getting new investors, and you pay off the original investors with the new money. This is a model that we've used for land development in many places, which we build somewhere new, with very, quite low density, with low taxes, and with not enough money collected up front to maintain the infrastructure. That works fine for a while because the infrastructure is all brand new. And then what we do is called sweating the infrastructure. So if you take something that's in a pretty good condition and you take advantage of that to have low maintenance costs and low taxes, you're sweating the infrastructure because you're taking advantage of the current good condition to not build up a reserve and to not maintain it. And so we do that, and so taxes are really low. We didn't get enough development funds in the first place, but eventually you can only sweat infrastructure so long. 
You run out of time to do that, you have to maintain. Your taxes are low, you can't afford it. But there's another plot of land. So you sell the next plot of land to a developer, use that money to keep up the infrastructure in the previous plot of, plot of land, and then you sweat that infrastructure for a while. That infrastructure gets old, you need another plot of land. So you send another plot of land, you can maintain the first two. Maybe you sell five more plot of lands to maintain the first two, right? You do this for a while. Eventually, you run out of land, and your Ponzi scheme is in big, big trouble. And so this is a development pattern that we've seen in many places, is you can only do that for so long, in part because you only have so much land, um, or laws catch up and they stop letting that type of development happen. But really low densities in terms of being environmentally problematic are problematic in terms of their expensive to maintain. So really, we should see much, much higher tax bases in low density areas and high density areas because the amount of infrastructure per person is much, much higher. Not universally, but often. So for a community that was newly developing, I would say take that into account, long-term thinking about how you're gonna pay and maintain for everything long-term thinking about resource use and environmental sustainability, and the best practice about how we build human scale cities so that people can get what they need and get around um, on foot or using shared resources, or bicycles. Okay, so the question is, what is my personal opinion about taking over the TTC subway infrastructure? Um, I'm gonna answer a slightly different question, which is, what is my personal opinion about the autonomy and role of cities? Okay. Cities are, in Canada, the majority of where people live. Um, our large cities like Toronto, Montreal, Calgary, Vancouver, together have one third or more of the country's population but they do not exist at a charter level. So in Canada's charter um, and, and our constitution, there is the federal government and the provincial government, and cities are the responsibility of the province. And this has meant for a long time that provinces can decide how, to a large extent how cities are governed. This existed in a sort of don't ask, don't tell kind of situation in, Ontario, in Canada for a long time because there was a tradition of what that meant and within certain bounds, we more or less stayed within that tradition. And that meant that cities were largely self-governing out of tradition rather than out of law. But we have seen a number of times in um, Ontario instances where that was not the case. So the amalgamation of Toronto um, at the beginning of the millennium was forced on the cities against their desire and still has reverberating consequences through the city. Um, many of them not for the good. We've also seen in the last year many manifestations of that around current changes to governance and ownership and rights structures between the provincial government and the city of Toronto. I think that cities are important places. I think they should be allowed to mature. I think that they need massive investment and an ability to think boldly. I don't think that we can do that within the current legal structure in Canada where cities do not exist as a place really within the constitutional framing of our country. Does that answer your question? Anybody else? So I just had one quick question. Um, so about the issue with the garden right now that's being discussed about whether we should continue to maintain it, even though it's a hard period in space, or if we should replace it with something more efficient. Mm -hmm. so I was just wondering if, if you could kind of speak about what, what would be involved with just maintaining it as opposed to replacing it, and some like the benefits to that. Or um, well, a major benefit of maintaining it instead of replacing it is the lack of disruption. So the gardener is used by a lot of people every single day, and if we take it down and build something new, that will be years where the gardener doesn't exist. And that's a huge disruption to all of the people who take it both in and out of the city, and all of the other people who are dependent on the people who take it both in and out of the city. So um, that's the main advantage. Um, there can also be advantage about material use, right? That is already there. If we were gonna build something just like that, then tearing it down would be in some ways wasting the materials. That's a complicated question that depends on many metrics. So uh, it depends. Um, 
whether or not we take it down, uh, and depending on what the other alternatives are, um, from a long-term impact in our transportation space is complicated because it depends a lot at the same time on what other options do we provide people. For many people, the gardener is currently their only option to get where they need to go in a reasonable amount of time, and that's, um, that's the outcome of the choices we've made about transportation infrastructure and land use in this region. From my understanding, we are committed to maintaining and upkeeping the gardener, and that that discussion is not currently active. Uh, but I could be if easily a few weeks out of date. Okay. Um, so the question was I've been that I have been talking about how there are implications of things that we've already done in our transportation and land use system that are setting us up for challenges. And the question was, do I think it's too late, or could we still change um, course? Uh, so there's a famous um, proverb that the best time to plant a tree was 10 years ago. The second best um, time to plant a tree is today. So we didn't plant the tree 10 years ago. And we tend to keep saying, shoot, we don't have any trees. I guess there's no point planting any. Shoot, we don't have any trees. I guess there's no point planting any. And we've been saying that for a really long time. So of course we can change course. We have to deal with the realities of where people currently live and what their current options are. Because any change in system is going to have winners and losers. And the losers will rightly feel hard done by because they made rational choices based on the existing system. And if the system changes and they lose, they'll feel hard done by. So I think within a conversation about change, we have to have a conversation about what does it mean for the people who lose in the situation. And some people will probably not be compensated for their loss, but some people probably should be, especially because given the way our city is laid out socioeconomically, a lot of the people who would lose would be less well off and people of color. And I think that's um, a disadvantage that of allocation of responsibility that we as a society should not accept. That said, we know how to solve this problem, right? One is stop doing the destructive behavior. And we haven't stopped doing that yet. And we still debate it all the time. And sometimes we stop for a little while and then we start again. So stop doing the destructive behavior would be step one. And the other would be major investments to facilitate a different way of living that involves a reallocation both of space and priorities and a real discussion about how we come up with invest money in our system. And those are political choices, but they're also engineering choices because we are experts in how you build infrastructure and we should not be abdicating responsibility for our system to people who don't understand the things that we do understand. you have to predict the future, probably a couple de decades after or in present, uh, like put the present situation. Um, that means you, there's just no way that you could be spot on of what people need in the future. And then that probably means people are never going to be satisfied with what you build, even though you spent a lot of effort, let's say 50 years ago, planning everything out. So, Okay, so the question was, since infrastructure takes a long time and predicting the future is hard, um, we're likely to get it somewhat wrong anyway, no matter what we do, and so people will still likely feel like infrastructure sucks, and so what should we do about that challenge? Um, so there's a couple of things there. One of the things that I think we need to keep in mind is that infrastructure in many instances creates the future. It's not that we need to 
just predict the future and react to it. That's a misnomer about how infrastructure should be approached. The infrastructure choices we make now in many ways create the future that we manifest in the future. So the cause and effect is the other way around. And we have been making that mistake um, in many aspects of our infrastructure system for a long time. Like we wait for traffic and then we say, oh, we need to adjust to our traffic. But it's the other way around. We need to create an infrastructure system and then the traffic system will adjust to our infrastructure system. So um, I think if I go back, um, infrastructure engineers build the future, right? So we create the future that will manifest. So then infrastructure systems take a long time to build, yes which is another good reason to be working on them now instead of just waiting for what they will be in the future. And there are some things that we can think about um, proactively right now. So one of the things that takes a really long time to build, in Canada right now we're building a bunch of really big new dams. We haven't built giant new dams in a while, but now we're doing it. And one of the reasons we're saying we need to build these new dams is because we need the electricity. But when we're looking at should we build a giant big new dam, there can be other questions on a sustainability hierarchy of how should we approach that first and what are the other opportunities. And so one of the ways we deal with this in, th in th um, the sustainable um, infrastructure systems is first, can you reduce demand for the thing you're trying to build up to so that you don't need anything new, right? Can you repurpose your current system to meet the needs that you need in the future. So for instance, lots of us use energy really inefficiently, and that's not just a matter of we don't turn out of lights, it's a matter of our system being inefficient because of the way it's structured, because of the way we build our buildings. And so we could work on that side, of, we could put work on the demand side instead of the supply side, and then we don't have to worry about the multi-billion dollar 20 year investment. Then the next stage down is, okay, if you can't deal with just mitigating the need in the first place, right? Like we could say, well, we could build more roads or we could just mitigate the need for that travel by having better co-location of, um, of opportunities. Can you do it in a way that isn't as huge as, in, can you do it in a modular way um, so that you can do a little bit now and a little bit later? Um, and sometimes the answer to that is yes and sometimes the answer is no. And then if the answer is no, then you're saying, okay, no, we really need this big thing, but we, at least we went through the process of thinking about did we really need this big thing? And then you're more likely to A, actually really need it, um, and B, having gone through the process, you often build a slightly better big thing in the first place, and um, you can then think about, okay, there are potentially negative externalities of the big dam or the big transportation project we were choosing, how can we mitigate those so people are less pissed off in 25 years? We have time for one more question. Okay. Okay, so the question was, I talked about my research on the greenhouse gas impact of the Shepherd subway, and I said that some people misinterpreted it. Um, the message that I wanted to send, uh, which I think I might have mentioned before, was that the, when we build large transportation infrastructure, it's an opportunity for change. But just because the opportunity exists doesn't mean the change will happen, and we need to be purposeful about the change. So if our goal is to have people travel differently, and we're gonna deliver a new piece of infrastructure with the goal of having people travel differently, we also need to um, change our policy framework, change other aspects of our transportation framework to give people nudges to change their travel behavior. Behavioral change needs a carrot and a stick. A new subway system is a carrot. Sometimes you also need the stick, or at least you need to not also be giving carrots in other places. And that can be hard for us, but if we want real change, we need policy around that not just a new opportunity. Sometimes a new opportunity will get there itself, but it often, often needs other policy as well. So my, I guess my point in one sentence or less was we should definitely build subways, but we shouldn't be stupid about building them. Okay, oh, oh, am I done? One more. Yeah. <sighs> 
Okay, so the question was that I showed a picture of being in Ghana and what did I think um, Ghana and similar countries should do about their infrastructure systems. And I think I'm gonna punt. Um, that is not within my area of expertise and uh, I, I don't think I'm, I don't think I can speak from an informed basis on that question. Okay, so the question was, um, I said that the uh, infrastructure infects, affects the environment, and but what about the environment affecting infrastructure? And then I'd said bike lanes are great, but then there's winter, and what should we do about things like bike lanes and sustainable infrastructure in a place that has winter? Um, so full disclosure, as I answer this question, um, I biked this week with a four-year-old. So I um, feel very comfortable biking um, even with a small child, in this weather. Um, so I have a bias in this question. Um, one of the things that we could do is allocate more space to biking. I mean, biking in the winter feels more tenuous because you might slip or the cars nearby, they might slip. And so it feels like you're in a slightly more tenuous situation. So I agree with that. Separated infrastructure helps with this because if you slip in a separated bike lane, you'll get bruised, but you're less likely to fly into traffic, which is a lot worse than a bruise. And you can hurt yourself seriously falling, but it's, you can hurt yourself very seriously getting hit by a car. Right? So separated infrastructure that really gives safe space to bicycles will help with that. Also, we already do plow the bike lanes, but we don't take it, in some instances, it doesn't work out that well because we'll plow the roads into the bike lane and then plow the bike lane. So we could prioritize bike lanes. There are places in the world where the first thing they clear when it snows are the sidewalks and the bike lanes. And that's not, an, that's not a very expensive change in priority. Um, and those, so we could just dedicate more maintenance to them. So more space and more maintenance would make those options less susceptible to winter.